Well, good morning. This is a presentation called Driving Change by Meta-Analysis from Mr. Barry's service from the Department of Breast Surgery. So meta-analysis has only been described for about 40 years and is uh, originally defined as the statistical analysis of a large collection of results from individual studies for the purpose of integrating the findings. Even though it's only been around quite a short time, it's made a very significant impact on modern research. So there's a number of different types of reviews that are present or used in journals currently. So a narrative review is usually invited by a journal by an expert or a group that describes a subset of studies in an area um, just to describe the current research or current direction of that research. A systematic review then uh, involves looking at a single question, doing a comprehensive search of all the studies which uh, pertain answers to that single question and combining or uh, identifying their data and appraising them. So one good example of this is the Cochrane collaboration that everyone will be aware of. <coughs> and then finally, meta-analysis involves an identical systematic search of all the studies looking at a single question, but statistically combines all the available data to, to make new results based on the larger numbers. So in terms of levels of evidence, meta-analysis and systematic reviews of large randomized controlled trials that are well performed represent the highest level of evidence available currently. Then well-performed randomized control trials also represent the second or, or combined highest level of evidence followed by prospective studies, retrospective studies, case reports, and then expert opinion. <coughs> In the context of modern research, there's some very significant advantages of meta-analysis then, the first being the ability to overcome type 2 statistical error, uh, which essentially means that when studies are small, uh, they or don't have a high enough number, they may fail to detect a clinically relevant effect. Um, the second major advantage of meta-analysis is that they can highlight a lack of evidence. So if you perform a meta-analysis in an area where a large number of retrospective studies have been performed, they can identify the bias that's present and they can identify areas that could be improved uh, in performing further prospective well-performed studies. So I have a number of examples of these from our department, uh, the breast surgery department in the matter. The first being a meta-analysis looking at the clinical impact of auxiliary lymph node dissection or auxiliary clearance in the treatment of invasive breast cancer. So to put this in context, there's some randomized controlled trials such as the Z11 trial suggests that selected patients um, with invasive breast cancer may not require an auxiliary clearance. Um, but there isn't an international consensus on the role of auxiliary clearance in all patients with invasive breast cancer in terms of their recurrence and overall survival benefit. So as was alluded to earlier in the paper of the week, um, when you perform a systematic review or meta-analysis, firstly you identify the area or uh, databases that you're going to take your information from. So this was the Medline database. And you use a very specific search term to identify all the available studies uh, which will have the answer to the question you're looking for. So the search term here was breast cancer and auxiliary lymph node dissection. Then you have to be very clear on the eligible studies and the exclusion criteria. So in this study, only randomized control trials, those looking at invasive breast cancer, and only comparative studies where they look at auxiliary clearance versus no auxiliary clearance, and adequate follow-up to determine recurrence and disease-free recurrence and overall survival. So again, as mentioned earlier, the, what's called the preferred reporting items in systematic reviews and meta-analysis methodology is used. And this is just used to identify from where the point you started was <coughs> to the ending point and how you excluded all the studies along the way. So this is the way meta-analysis present their data. This is a forest plot. Um, the black line in the center denoted by one at the bottom as a line which represents no statistical significance. Each black box uh, represents the odds ratios of the individual trials and the size of the black box represents the number of patients in each study. Then the horizontal line with each black box is the confidence interval. So uh, this is a very good example of overcoming type 2 statistical error. Um, so we see there's four large studies uh, all randomized control trials looking at uh, auxiliary <coughs> clearance versus no auxiliary clearance um, in terms of recurrence. And each study suggests that there, there's no major difference between auxiliary clearance and no auxiliary clearance. However, when all the data is combined in a total of 7,347 patients, you find that the combined data at the bottom of the white diamond demonstrates there is a potential increased risk of auxiliary 
disease recurrence if no auxiliary lymph node clearance is performed. And again, um, the same effect is identified. There's a slightly increased risk in mortality in the presence of no auxiliary clearance versus auxiliary clearance in the present in invasive breast cancer. So the second example of a uh, paper from our department looking at uh, meta-analysis to determine if resection of the primary tumour in metastatic breast cancer impacts on survival. And this is a very good example of how meta-analysis can be performed to highlight a lack of evidence um, available in current research areas. So the current management of metastatic breast cancer would usually focus on the treatment of systemic disease with chemotherapy, and it's not believed removing the primary tumour will impact anyone's survival. Again, to do this, you identify the uh, databases from which you'll take your information. You use a very clear search term to identify all the studies which will have an answer to this question. And you use very clear eligibility and exclusion criteria. So stage four metastatic breast cancer, they have to have comparative data, so primary surgery versus systemic treatment alone. They have to have adequate uh, survival or adequate follow-up to assess survival and must be appropriately staged. And again, you use the preferred reporting items and systematic reviews and meta-analysis methodology to show your starting point and the point at which you had your uh, included studies. So this is, again, a forest plot. And if you look at all the studies available um, in a, a total of 28,600 patients, uh, it appears when you look at all the data that at the bottom here, you see the combined data shows that uh, in terms of surgery or in terms of treatment, surgery for the primary tumour appears to very significantly favour improved survival. Um, so once you have this data, you can look at the other factors which may influence this. So going through all the studies that have survival data available for surgery versus no surgery, uh, you can look at things like comorbidities in the patients who underwent surgery, increasing tumour stage or T stage, and increasing number of metastases. And when you do this, you identify that those patients are much less likely to undergo an operation, indicating that the survival data has very significant bias present. So according to the current evidence, there is a survival benefit with removing the primary tumour, but according to the current evidence as well, most of these patients will have a heavier metastatic burden and a higher T stage. So uh, this type of study really promotes uh, doing better <coughs> prospective studies to further answer this question. This is just a further illustration of this with some data. So when you combine data from all studies, you'll see that uh, those undergoing surgery, a higher percentage of them will have only one metastasis versus um, a lower percentage with multiple metastases or a higher metastatic burden. And this would, of course, influence survival. And the same effect is seen for the T stage. So those undergoing surgery frequently had a lower T stage and those uh, undergoing uh, surgery, or it was less frequent for patients with a higher T-stage to undergo an operation. <coughs> so this was also used uh, to look at stage 4 colorectal cancer with unresectable metastases. So we looked at the patients undergoing resection of the primary tumour with metastatic colorectal cancer and found that those undergoing resection um, were much, or those undergoing resection were much less likely to have multiple metastases compared to those undergoing no resection. Again, influencing survival and providing important data on how we should perform further studies in this area. So this is just an example of a number of meta-analysis from our department in the Department of Breast Surgery here. Um, and just for interns, SHOs and, and registrars looking to publish papers, um, some additional benefits. So. Uh, often meta-analyses are favoured by journals because they're usually highly cited by any subsequent studies on the same topic. So if you produce a meta-analysis in stage 4 breast cancer and surgery, <coughs> any subsequent studies in that area are, hard, are highly likely to uh, reference yours. There isn't any ethics committee approval or red tape uh, or problems getting started. And very frequently when you email uh, authors of meta-analysis or um, retrospective or prospective studies to get data for your own meta-analysis, they're more than happy to provide it because they know their paper will be cited. <coughs> then finally, just a few important pitfalls if you are performing any meta-analysis. If you've one very large study with a number of smaller studies uh, or a number of very small studies, often your results will just be 
uh, identical to the largest study in your group if none of the others can compete with its size and this is a good example of a forest plot demonstrating this and one other important aspect is the presence of publication bias so frequently if you do a, a very good uh, scientific study for instance based on uh, tumor biomarkers uh, if at the end your results show that that biomarker may not have or that factor may not identify the presence of cancer or be a positive predictive factor it's very difficult to get that published um, and this is often the type of for or type of funnel plot you'll see with that so this vertical axis represents the size of the studies and this axis represents the effect so the, the larger a study is usually the smaller an effect uh, you'll identify um, so you should see a, a, an even spread in terms of results so this would represent a funnel plot where there's unbiased publications and this represents a funnel plot where all the publications appear to indicate one result which is a very strong indicator of publication bias in an area.